and we're live this week listeners take the wheel we'll be answering your questions about the google manifesto talking gender and politics and technology the moto z2 force one of the more controversial phones we've reviewed this year and we'll have some fun discussions on software assistance plus your questions and comments coming in from email and twitter there's a lot to discuss so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 265 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded August 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid and you had a huge crush on Ali Sheedy and War Games. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor of PocketNow.com, blasting the signal from sunny Southern California, joined as always by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong out on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy boy? Hello, and uh, welcome to all our viewers live on the East Coast and the West Coast and around the world. Uh, I, I'm assuming that there has to be someone in Burma watching this right now, wondering what the heck is going on with the computer. I would hope so. I really feel like Burma does not come up enough in our tech conversations. And so if there's someone in Burma who has a pressing need to answer some smartphone questions, this would be the week to do it. Yes, let's let's get them on the show right <laughs> now. <laughs> Sweet. And <clears throat> I just have to apologize to all of the viewers and listeners. Um, Look at that head cold going on right there. Mm, I, I, yeah. uh, apparently, when you have a toddler, they are just a, an incubator for all kinds of ridiculously fun diseases. So I'm, I'm working on a little head cold. And I kind of overdid it a little on the uh, the pre-show. We do a Periscope right before we go live just to kind of have a casual Q&A every week and uh i was about halfway through that going you know what this was probably a bad idea <laughs> i'm gonna try not to cough and snort and you know like do a whole bunch of gross stuff right in front of my microphone but i just uh, apologies that i probably won't be able to completely contain all of the gross humanity coming out lots of face. slurping noises yeah that <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> I think I might have to edit that out for the audio. <laughs> I hope you don't, because that was hilarious. I almost hacked up on the microphone doing it. Good idea to be able to, you know, uh, bring that up and bring all your sicknesses to the podcast. And we want you to also chip in uh, your questions, too, because those can be sick questions. Yeah. So um, yeah. do that by going on to Twitter going on to that PN Weekly hashtag, hashtag PN Weekly, and submitting your questions like that if we're on the air live at this uh, hour, 3 p.m. Eastern, 10th of August, and, you know, we'll be able to answer them live. That's the kind of the appeal of it. And if you can't do that, why don't you do what others have done in the past? Many others have done. It's a great thing, great process. It's crafting up an email and sending it over <laughs> podcast at pocketnow.com i was going to think of another word other than crafting but i was like i'm trying no, to I mean, it's like crafting nailed it but then there was the, the anticipatory oh, pause no too like, much. Ooh, ooh, it's gonna be really oh it's email he's talking about email okay i get it <laughs> so send that send that pop three server thing wow over pop, to really what? i feel most people in our audience are probably imap people <laughs> I'm gonna say it's probably what they're doing um, let's do that. Let's make that, that was, thing. See, that was me not being a good improv actor, not going with your premise and the yes and, and just like, nope, hard stop, not pop, but IMAP. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'll see you at the Apollo. And so we are, we already have at the Apollo. Man, I'd get gonged so quickly. Um, we already have uh, some some great questions coming in on Twitter using that PN Weekly hashtag. A comment from Hugh Richardson while we're recording this. Great. Now I have to watch War Games again. It's a yearly viewing for me. I have to watch that film at least once a year because it's just such a fun movie, and I'm a I'm a big uh, Matthew Broderick fan. But. Mm. Um, you know, uh, definitely hit us up on the emails. Definitely hit us up on that Twitter using that hashtag. But before we jump into more tech tomfoolery, we do need to thank this week's sponsor, and that's HelloFresh. <clears throat> now, HelloFresh is a farm-to-box, couch-to-kitchen meal delivery service which aims to make cooking more fun. So you can focus on the entire experience of putting your food and meal together, not just that finished plate that you're going to take a photo of that no one's going to look at on Facebook. I use Instagram. I get a few more likes that way. Each week, HelloFresh delivers delicious new recipes with step-by-step -step cooking instructions broken down into six major segments. This actually is pretty helpful to the way that they divide the, the labor 
the prep and then the actual uh, the cooking, the preparation for uh, each meal that they send. Um, so each meal is designed to take around 30 minutes to prepare. And so even for kitchen novices or for experienced cooks who might be short on time, you can whip up something really tasty, really efficiently. They source the freshest ingredients, freshest ingredients measured to the exact quantities needed. This reduces food waste. Um, and, and I do have to throw another shout out here. We've, we've had them as a sponsor on the podcast a number of times. And thankfully, uh, yeah, this is a service that I've continued to use past their little introductory, like they gave us a couple free meals to play with. And I really do like the way that they package up each meal. So you don't just get a big gnarly bag full of ingredients. You get these individual cardboard containers so you know exactly what's going to go into each meal. And that does reduce the amount of time it takes to cook each meal. Less than $10 per serving, you can select between the classic plan, vegetarian options, and a family box to feed more people. Uh, definitely check out their menu. They've got all kinds of really tasty and uh, really interesting flavor and food combinations. Uh, chicken parma, uh, parmigiana salad, juicy Lucy burger with molten cheese core, zesty crusted catfish. I mean, that was in the first week of meals that I got from the service. Uh, and, and all of them were winners. We were impressed with the, uh, the flavor combinations on all of them. HelloFresh employs two full-time dietitians to ensure each meal is nutritionally balanced. And they're offering a summer fare now. So definitely check them out alongside new breakfast options. Get your day started off right. Excuse me. I'm, I'm kind of hungry for lunch already. I'm like getting all salivatory right now. Delicious ingredients you'll love to eat. Simple recipes you'll love to cook. HelloFresh has a special offer for listeners of the PN Weekly. Get $30 off your first week of deliveries when you use the promo code POCKETNOW30. Again, $30 off your first week when you sign up at HelloFresh.com with the promo code POCKETNOW30. And we thank them for sponsoring the Pocket Now Weekly. Indeed, and I'm, I'm certainly like, uh, liking what I see here for this week. So for August 19th, uh, like chicken cheddar fajitas and uh, Italian chipotle cheeseburgers, Parmesan crusted fish. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really... Again, we, we've got to stop producing this podcast before before we eat. I think we should just stop, just give up <laughs> on the whole food, like uh, the, the prepared food services, because that is not really doing anything for our, like, um, ability to podcast it's it's it just it doesn't work it or doesn't it could be work. really obnoxious and be eating like while we do the podcast I mean... <laughs> we could be making the stuff while we do the podcast all right so uh the sharp aquas uh let me hold on let me just i gotta check on this boiling water here because it's gonna <laughs> right. yeah. actually i i mean again mixing food and tech i'm i'm on board i think we should absolutely do that if definitely... anyone's if anyone's definitely... really a fan of our videos on youtube i do have a hidden recipe on one of our reviews for my ultimate uh, uh, turkey melt recipe. Yeah, you just have to follow all the numbers at the end. That's always right. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone right. can find that, I definitely give it a share on Twitter or something, and I'll and I'll echo chamber that because I hid <laughs> it in one of my reviews, and uh, that you yourself cannot find. Right. Yeah, and so it's it is it's the ultimate turkey melt. But we should probably stop talking about food now and get into actual news stuff. We should. For the week of August 7th, 2017, this is all the news that is fit to fod fodcast, foodcast, podcast. Yeah, that's Bam. Good. We begin Nailed with the it. iPhone 8 potentially entering mass production. Uh, supply chain sources believe that as component makers have seen major annual sales gains, iPhone 8 assemblers may just assume start getting more money from Apple, well ahead of previous bank expectations for October and November. Production on the iPhone 7S and 7S Plus is also said to be starting too. The Essential Phone is also starting full production. The news coming vis-a-vis -a, -vis a tweet from Andy Ruman, the company's founder. The news follows the Wall Street Journal's one-on-one -on -one talk with company president Niccolo De Macy, where, among other things, he detailed a unit sales goal in the low single-digit millions. Best Buy and Amazon will be unlocked retail partners. China sees its first sharp phone in forever as the Fox brand, the Foxconn brand, launched the Aquos S2 this week. The standard version features a Snapdragon 630, has a dual camera system, and a 2 by one display that surrounds the selfie camera and receiver, if you think about the Essential Phone's design, much like that. It's not even clear when Japan, Sharp's home country, will see this phone, much less any other country, but 
It's said to range around the upper 400s, lower 500s US. The Lenovo K8 Note follows through on the manufacturer's promise to move to stock Android on its own brand phones. It debuted in India with a 10-core MediaTek processor, dual cameras, Dolby Atmos sound, and a 4,000 milliamp hour battery. Amazon India will launch the phone on August 18. The reveals continue, though this one's more quiet. The Galaxy S8 Active has landed on AT&T without any prelude. Take the Galaxy S8, apply a thick polymer case and a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, and you have an active phone. Pre-orders are online right now. Sales from August 11. T-Mobile has its own phone to talk about, too. TCL was rumored to have made this the Revel, that is R-E-V-V-L. Some entry-level specs will cost zero down and five dollars a month. It marks the debut of the Smart Picks phone lineup. Each of the phones offered will be automatically placed onto a new Jump On Demand lease program where users can upgrade once as often as every 30 days. Apple is playing with augmented reality tech. In prototypes of a new smart glasses concept, we see 3D cameras at play, but it seems that I.O. will mostly be left to a contingent iPhone. No word on ETA, but we do have a better grip on an Apple Watch 3 with LTE capabilities. Apparently, the engineering team have figured out a way where a modem wouldn't suck up all the battery. Uh, they've been working on this since at least last year. A final product should be out this fall, according to Bloomberg. Finally, new emoji candidates have been proposed for the standard set to take effect in June 2018. There are a few body parts to be had. Objects like teddy bears, magnets, and brick walls, and... Um, well, you you know this is going to be good. A sad <coughs> pile of poo. A sad yeah, the poop happy emoji. Poo, My life is now complete. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I want, well, I just wanted to throw this out there just to see um, if they're. I mean, they're already on the boards. We have like thousand coming up to like two thousand of them. Many of them. I mean, you know, we we still have many to go. So I'm wondering yeah. what you're missing out on. Well, I mean, really, it, it's. Uh, I I feel like we probably just need a few more fill-in emojis so that we can finally complete the return to hieroglyphics for communication. <laughs> All of these letters and numbers, they're just really inconvenient. And what I really feel we should be doing is using sort of more like uh, pictograph style forms of uh, communication. Areas. In- Game. I think uh, Rhett and Lunka already did that once. So um, if we could <laughs> bring that, we could commercialize that concept, uh, we can always start from just you know educational games because I think that's always totally. the way to go. Totally. And then we'll need translators for like people my age and older, so I can write out a message and it'll just convert it into all emojis. You know. Yeah, we're not all like um, artists, designers, and you know standardized. You know, we can't just continuously replicate these things unless you know i mean if you if you have like sanskrit or chinese where the characters are more complicated i think you'd be able to handle that better other than <laughs> that i mean english you know with the standard um you know arabic <laughs> all that stuff like that's it's just simple strokes really yeah okay so emojis that's definitely a thing um no what, right, what i wanted to circle back to though was apple watch um mm-hmm. that the series three is coming out uh i'd be very surprised if the watch looks fundamentally different than previous incarnations of the apple watch cellular capabilities could be really interesting because i think right now a lot of times we bill like lte connectivity is this like mainline way that you can stay connected when really i think it's only useful in short bursts like i want to take a workout um, and for the duration of the workout, I want this connectivity. And then as soon as I'm done with the workout and I'm back at home, I shut it back off again. But uh, yeah, what I wanted to put out there was the uh, the notion that this could have glucose uh, checking built in. Uh, this could be something that is also now double double dipping or serving as a way to help manage other health issues like uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Which I don't think is actually, I mean... It, it, it's there, it's been suggested, it's been hinted, and, you know, it'd be great if it were on there, but I th- I, I'm not exactly sure if that would be a mo- the most reliable thing. I mean, the, you're talking about a whole, bu- a whole bunch of a, a big, huge population, and relying on mm-hmm. this kind of, meh, kind of a, a untested 
uh, metric or untested uh, mechanism. So for, I don't know, three, four hundred dollars, is this going to be a worthwhile investment compared to a dedicated, uh, you know, insulin dispenser, breeder, whatever? It's it's still it's going to have to go through the trials and all that. Well, it will. And and so I, I don't think anyone would look at a piece of consumer electronics as a way to fully encompass management of a disease like diabetes. But um, what, what's really important is because like we have a lot of technology, there are Dexcoms, there are glucose blood testing devices where you have to like prick your finger, prick skin to get blood out. Um, what could be really interesting is a way to track general trends. So if we had an Apple Watch, which didn't have to you know, break skin to get general trends on something like blood glu glucose level, that could also be beneficial to a number of other people in society, other things like uh, uh, you know, people that are on like ketogenic diets, for example, would probably want to be aware of that in the same way that right now, I like being generally aware of my heart rate. Is this the most accurate heart rate monitor? No, it's really not. And I would never depend on this if I had some sort of cardiac issue that needed uh, like actual care. So I kind of look at this as the same thing. Like if you have an Apple watch and you're a diabetic, you can get a really good overview of general trends. Then you also have all of the, the fun lifestyle benefits of having an Apple watch. Um, you wouldn't rely on it as a way to really manage your disease, but it's extra information that helps fill in the gaps in between those times you have to test your blood. And then I think for a lot of other people, that could be really interesting. So for example, let's say you're pre-diabetic and you don't know it, and you start seeing blood sugar spikes after meals, that could be valuable information for helping to change up your workouts, change up your diet, or have a conversation with your doctor. Indeed. And uh, also, uh, well, I had a thought in there that just disappeared, uh, but uh, it was about uh, on the general aspect of j increasing usage time. Yeah, that's right. Um, because we've seen this with Fitbit where usage time has collapsed. Uh, the sessions are just not up to where they were. And that's, you know, that's where the company has led itself down to kind of a crisis point where uh, investors are not really believing in that. So, I mean, if that's a metric that uh, Apple wants to increase, I think this is a definitely a great way to be able to do that, at least in terms of one population. I'm not sure exactly if, um, you know, if it's a go-to, because if you're pre-diabetic, if you don't know it, and you have to actually go to the app, and, you know, if you, it has to be something that you actively care about in the first place before you right. bring it up. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know. So... But we do have a question here using the PN Weekly hashtag from at Rena Chan. Is there a way to measure glucose from the skin sweat? And technically, yes. I just don't know that any manufacturer has ever put out a device specifically to do that because of some of the concerns we're talking about. It would be marketed towards diabetics, and it's not nearly as accurate as doing a, a, a blood test. Um, to measure your glucose levels. But there are also other sort of uh, other ways that people have helped manage diseases like diabetes. Like you can train dogs to detect the quality of smell and sweat that comes off of someone who's diabetic because that extra sugar in their blood in their bloodstream is going to impact things like the smell and taste of their sweat. <laughs> Sounds so gross. I'm sorry. And yeah. I'm sort of really overgeneralizing here. And, and anyone who's a diabetic is probably like smashing their face against their computer right now listening to us talk about this. Um, but there are different ways that you can do that. This would be a consumer facing way with broad acceptance if Apple decides to actually implement it or maybe make it a part of like a watch band or a watch strap. So it's not in every Apple watch, but it, there's a, a way to use it um, with uh, sort of proprietary hardware. Indeed, indeed. I want to circle uh, back to a central phone because oh, yeah. uh, beyond the whole, you know, being eight weeks late or even longer because they have just hit full production. I do want to talk yeah. a little bit about uh, the Demisi's comments uh, from uh, just uh, yesterday where it's, you know, he's basically mostly just parroting developments that we've caught on to, like the Best Buy and uh, Amazon retail holding, and also um, uh, other, like the whole two weeks kind of general ETA timeline. And then, yeah. you know, of course, Andy Room had to like come in and say, oh, it's happening now. So um, <laughs> there's the whole 
what do you think about Amazon and the, its Alexa fund and uh, Ten Cents? You know, China, China, huge tech conglomerate, funding three hundred million dollars to this venture now because now we're starting to see different expectations about how you know the you know essential home is going to be a key asset to this where the you know it can do all sorts of things with google assistant or all the other assistants out there alexa included and then just a chinese power coming into play in in the us <laughs> you know that's actually what i'm a little less well versed on is looking at 10 cents business model and seeing how a strategic partnership with essential phone could benefit or could could help improve their catalog of services and products. Um, in, in the United States, obviously, in North America, the Amazon side of this is probably the more compelling part of the discussion. Uh, whether or not this will influence uh, Essential Phone to play with Alexa compatibility is going to be, I think, a very interesting position for a smartphone manufacturer to take right now. But I think there's something really compelling about the idea of Amazon having that direct partnership with a company that they can then promote as sort of a crown jewel flagship unlocked phone. We know that their first, uh, Essential's first partnership is with Sprint. So we will see Essential Phone showing up on Sprint. That's their carrier deal. But we've seen Amazon make some significant inroads in selling unlocked phones to North Americans. And so those are usually budget devices, less expensive devices, entry level devices. So having a manufacturer set specifically on offering a flagship device and one that's being billed as, you know, like new cutting edge technologies, modular phone, wireless USB adaptations, uh, a very bold design, whether or not that front facing selfie camera turns people off. Um, I think that could be that could be a really a really good partnership for both Amazon and Essential both for promoting a device, not having to rely on Sprint ad dollars for all of the device promotion, and then having another outlet where people not on Sprint would have access to that phone too. Yeah, and in terms of like the whole uh, Sprint deal, because SoftBank is the Japanese parent company of Sprint, and there was a little talk where SoftBank would have uh, invested, I think it was you know 100 million or something like that, yeah. into uh, the company, into Essential, and was they pulled out because Apple uh, decided to join in on the fund that it was going to, you know, use to do that with. And since Essential was competing with uh, with Android and with uh, you know, against Apple, that would yeah have been productive. But you know, it was it, one of these big, you know, angel investors with money with that's interested in tech is going to be flying around, whether it be it you know uh, uh, Elon Musk for some reason or Tencent, as uh, you see right here. So, yeah. uh, and especially with TPP uh, going, <laughs> it just, I'm going, I'm getting uh, beyond my depth here, depth here but, um, you know, the, the, there is an expanding realm of China's uh, economic muster. So, uh, with well, that, you know, kind of America first, and then it's just. <laughs> it, it, right. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Well, it but you know, Andy Rubin's reputation I think is deserving of a shot like this. It's just when we start talking about this kind of money coming in from other players and other investors like it puts a lot more pressure on the brand. So mm -hmm. that we, we were watching Recode, the first thing I thought of when um when we got the news about Amazon and Tencent was that little quip he made about it's okay for us to take longer to scale you know, because we want to make sure that we can actually fulfill shipping and manufacturing. And then as the business gets larger, we have different concerns. That changes a little when you've got players like Amazon and Tencent dumping hundreds of millions of dollars into your company. Now the the risk reward is is greater and the expectations are higher from people outside the company. So I'll be curious to see how this first generation plays off. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to have super high expectations for this thing selling or, you know, outselling an established brand. But can they show some kind of consumer relationship, consumer attachment that they can build off of? And that's going to be like a three to four year process if they're really serious about being in the smartphone space. But even from generation one, we've got to see some kind of uptick, some kind of conversation, some kind of enthusiast that's going to that's going to be a fan of this brand 
Um, because these cannot be a geek and nerd phone. I mean, they've made it pretty clear. Uh, the Macy made it pretty clear that, you know, they want to build an emote. They actually use your kind of go-to terms of emotive uh, attachment yeah. and all that. So, I mean, um, will it be well, like... Especially Apple? for how critical yeah. Ruben is of the current Android ecosystem, right? You know, the person, people who helped create the current smartphone paradigm that we understand oh, today. Yeah. And yeah. he's the one that's wanting to shift it more aggressively. So we'll we'll see. I'll uh, I, I, this is all just the we're all super curious to see how this plays out. But damn, if they're not going to be facing crazy competition, there's a quintet of phones coming out at the end of this year, which are all going to be monster performers, all trying to occupy the limelight. And Andy Rubin's name is the major differentiator for essential phone becoming a success or becoming a failure. That's a lot of pressure to put on an individual backing up a brand a new brand he has a name it's it's called andy rubin and he happened to be one <laughs> of the on the credit list for android so i mean you know, he he's built up you know this all these little ventures and uh is funding new ventures with it through his playground uh initiative so mm -hmm. i mean he bootstrapped it, uh bootstrapped this thing out of uh partially out of pay, uh, playground so uh, and also Google Fun, I think Red B or something like that. Is that uh, Google uh, Alphabet? Uh, that one I don't know. I'm actually not familiar. I don't know that that brand name. Yeah. But a so, company yeah. that doesn't need to bootstrap a product but is still facing very similar concerns is uh, Samsung. I've uh, finally taken the wraps off, officially announcing that Galaxy S8 <laughs> Active. Um, so it's you guys know. Quiet. It's quiet. You got to, there's no pre -lit. So, but you guys know I'm super excited about this. The Active has always been my favorite phone of the year. And you're telling me I can have a smaller screened S8, not the S8 Plus, but with a battery bigger than the S8 Plus and in a more rugged shell because I'm not a huge fan of glass back devices. This is already shaping up to be my favorite Samsung of the year. But it was quietly announced. It was like the press release came out of nowhere. It was, hey, we're, we're selling it now. Okay, bye. So really, it's like it was they just... knew they were way late. You know, it's like not only keeping expectations low, but keeping expectations almost non-existent. They're they're prevent they're trying to. I, I'm not sure if this is a def definitive like gap for uh you know just letting the Galaxy Note 8 breathe. But I mean, it, it's sort of a shame to you know be able to just. It's a for they've got great battery going on here. Uh, <laughs> We've never we not got we have not got to touch the damn thing. Uh, right. So, I mean, we can't really assess the durability and all that. Although we would hope that it would be better from the S7 Active with all its um, uh, water resistance. Um, yeah, S7 <laughs> kerfuffles. Faced a, few, a few manufacturing issues. I mean, from uh, I think we started doing we we've been doing this like yearly get together mm -hmm. in Southern California where we take active phones to water parks. Um, a bunch of just local bloggers, uh, Trisha Hirschberger, uh, um, Rich DeMiro from KTLA. We've done this a bunch of times. And from the S4 active to the S7 active, the S7 active is the only time we had a phone fail. So we'd usually have like five or six, like going down <laughs> water slides or going underwater, getting pelted by like jets and stuff like that. And uh, out of five S7 actives, we did have one that uh, that that died on the lazy river um but of all things the lazy river. <laughs> right yeah i mean but it was like it, we we're pretty sure like it had taken abuse before then and then just we were trying to shoot video i was like oh this one doesn't work anymore <laughs> um but considering you know like how aggressive we put those phones through potential water damage situations that's still not bad um that's still not a bad ratio it's just not as solid as what we thought the s6 active was so hopefully they've sorted that out for the s8 active like I said, yeah. like these are always my favorites. I like grippy backs. I like rugged construction. I like not having to throw a case on it. I'm even like kind of okay with the charmingly ugly, lumpy Klingon ridges and fake camo and all of those crap adaptations that make it seem like a tough phone. Um, so I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you uh, contacted your? Um... I can't even speak now. Uh, can you con have you contacted your uh, PR uh, in on either side? No, I mean we we haven't heard anything uh, anything official on when we'll be able to get our hands on one. Um, and unfortunately, I think everyone Not sort of knows. Even the PR teams that I work with, everyone sort of knows. Like 
no one's going to be talking about this outside of like a little feature piece, you know, like it's not going to get the same kind of coverage and it kind of doesn't need it. You know, a lot of this stuff is just carried over from the regular S8, but what conversation we would have had at the beginning of the summer, if this thing had launched in June, just like every other active would have been a lot more interesting to talk about. Um, is it a summer phone? It's a vacation phone. It's a travel phone. It makes a lot of sense in that regard, but now it's going up against IFA coverage, Note 8 coverage, V30 coverage. It's just gonna get it's just gonna get hammered. So I, I think even here they're they're scaling way back on trying to promote it. Um, and I don't even think we're gonna do our little water park trek this year just because uh, summer's almost over. You know, <laughs> so we'll see we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, hopefully that that might. I mean, that you should go just for the sake of going. I think that's that's. Definitely I mean, like important. if if we do it, I'm there. Because, like I said, who doesn't want to, for work, I mean, I have to do it for work, go to a water park and play with the phone. And it, and it's great, because even though we have more water-resistant devices out there now, you know, like an LG, you see water resistance, yeah. uh, regular Samsungs are now water-resistant, HTC, you still, like, you're playing around with phones in water, and people still act like... It's, like a, it's a unique thing, yeah. When <laughs> in Japan, taking baths with their phones for, for the longest time, texting totally. their friends, so. Totally, and Sony was well, all over it. Um, from Hugh Sony. Richardson at Soulless Geek using the PN Weekly hashtag, I'd be all over in S8 active except comma AT and T. Uh, it is an AT and T exclusive. I really wish Samsung would deliver a, a, a at least a European variant, maybe called you know the Galaxy S8 Tough or something like that. <laughs> Um, from at at Peter at Hayton Peter Peter Hayton, um, I guess this year why not compare this with all of the other waterproof phones in the water park? It's all scientific testing, so I will. I have to take six phones and dunk them all underwater and see which phone survives. I'm really excited about uh, getting an active into the mix against like an LG G6. I mean, yeah, as long as they're willing to like, you know, we don't have to buy a unit. That's 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 going to be <laughs> great. Because at this right. point, we, we I I spent you know I sp spent a little money on the you know our Note Eight coverage uh, already, and it's like it's going to it's going to be fun. But man, I'm not going to be able to eat while I'm going to be there. So who knows? <coughs> we'll we'll help feed you. Who knows? I, I hear they've got like good good food in uh in New the, York. In New York, so we'll 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 maybe, get you up with maybe. something. I hear that. Well, you can see full details on these stories and more. Hit pocketnow.com and look for the podcast section to get to this episode's rundown. You can also chat with us about what you've been reading up on with hashtag PN Weekly. Also, be sure to catch Jaime Rivera and the Pocket Now Daily on our YouTube channel. And now I think it's uh, time for something that's long been overdue. Again, uh, we're going to talk about some listener mail. Listeners, this would take be the point where I put the, the dun dun little, little, little <laughs> WebOS bong. We haven't done the bong bong yet. So long. That, that that WebOS still is a thing that existed. <laughs> oh, I was with Brandon Van Andry, uh, a friend of the show, uh, also a Tech Beer podcast, uh, and uh, he, he like he he brought up WebOS like like immediately on our like uh when i came around to him <laughs> right so that's that's still active in 2017 great terrific sort of <sighs> like those servers don't work anymore but it's no. still a thing right it's, i guess it's still a thing well anyways um enough about web os because let's talk about something that is uh android it, it's it's current. And uh, we go on to Aaron Linson. Uh, hello, Pocket Now team. I was wondering, as a person currently running a G5 from LG, uh, would going for a Moto Z2 Force be good? I was also wondering, would it work for a job on a, an assembly line? As far as the unbreakable display, do you think this phone would be perfect for me? Uh, thanks, Aaron Linson. Uh, P.S. I talked to Michael about accessibility on both Android and iOS when he was the host. I would love to talk about this again as things have changed since I last talked. So, um, I mean, what the Moto Z2 Force is, it has a shatterproof display, but it's not specific. It's not really what I would think of as a durable phone. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, again, if it, we're sort of parsing a couple different phrases in there. And if you're looking for a more rugged 
phone experience, I don't know that I would put this up there as a device that would fulfill that kind of criteria. It's, I think it's only rated for modest splash resistance, not for any kind of enhanced water resistance. And the Shattered Shield display is definitely more flexible. So it's gonna help against like a really bad corner drop and not like rippling through and spider web cracking your screen. But I don't know that it has any kind of specific uh, mil spec um, drop yeah. resistance rating, at least I, not that I've been able to look up. And someone's going to correct me on this. It's made out of a 7,000 series aluminum. I'm not sure what, you know, how that compares right. to. And, 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 those, yeah. and those things are, are important build quality things to describe, but that still doesn't give us a proper rating, you know, an yeah. expectation of what this thing should be able to survive. And plus, I still feel like um, we're going to be doing our full review on Friday for the Moto Z2. And as a spoiler for that review, there is a significant trade off for having that shatter shield display out of the box. Like I have not gotten a screen protector for it yet. And I have yeah. numerous scratches, very, very fine light scratches that I wouldn't have on another, on a glass. Or I, think that, glass. I think that conclusion has long been spoiled by a lot of other people. Totally. I just feel it's important yeah. to reiterate, you know, we're, we're there, those things come with compromises. And so if you're worried about drop resistance, shatter shield is fantastic tech, but I really wish Motorola would deliver a first party glass screen protector. Um, to augment the lifestyle durability of the device, the chucking it into a purse, uh, it accidentally gets put into a pocket with your keys. You know, that's a dangerous scenario for the Z2 Force where it's just sort of a minor bummer if it's any other phone out there <laughs> where it's probably not going to scratch up that display. Um, uh, quick question, because we've been talking about the Galaxy uh, Active. Um, the S7 yeah. Active had a shatterproof display, didn't it? Uh, yes, but I don't believe it was the same kind of plastic. Yeah, it's not the same kind of thing, but, um, did you, uh, did you ever get around to, like, okay. really testing that thing? Not, not in, like, trying to rake it, because I have my S7 Active here, actually, within arm's reach. It's funny how, out of all um, of Samsung phones, the Actives are almost always closer than the regular S's. <laughs> and so this is yeah, like i don't see any significant scratches and this was a phone that went down water slides we did drop testing on it um and it's been used pretty aggressively also as the kid phone so we'll fire yeah. this up with a bunch of netflix and let my daughter sort of chuck it around while we're like flying or traveling so she can watch word party um and it's in the screen on this is in better shape than the screen on my moto z2 which i've had for a little less than two weeks so <laughs> over a year of active lifestyle potential Galaxy damage Galaxy situation. Active lifestyle. <laughs> I just realized, yeah. I uh, just used the brand name of the phone in there, um, the model line of the phone, versus very light use, a camera test, and the first week of reviewing. And this is already a little bit more rougher wear than the active is. And so that that is definitely, I think, that's a concern that I... I feel needs to be reiterated as we go through talking about these different devices. Um, Cause there's an expectation that phone screens can handle a certain amount of abuse. And I don't feel that the Moto Z2 lives up to that expectation. If you were coming from another phone. Indeed. Indeed. So, I mean, do, what do you think in terms of just that kind of blush? Uh, do you feel like, um, you know, if you had to really nail it down, because I'm not sure in, in terms of uh, Aaron's uh, timeline in terms of upgrading, but uh uh, what do you think? Moto Z2 Force well, or Galaxy S7 Active? Well, actually, I mean, if if we're talking about durability mm -hmm. as being the killer app, then yeah. I, I mean, if you can go for an Active, go for an Active. Maybe also consider a, a G6 uh, because you're already on a G5 and the G6 is rated for enhanced drop resistance as well, though I don't trust a glass back phone as much as I trust the metal back on the V20. But we have and proper it, yeah. ratings for what we should expect from those phones. Uh, if the killer app, though, like let's say, Aaron, you were really into the idea of having a modular phone, well, then the only game in town is Motorola. So I don't know if you were using your G5 because you liked swapping between the camera grip or the B&O DAC or something like that. Then I think you'd really enjoy the Moto Mod. Uh, experience on a Moto Z2. But if the if the main feature that you're looking for is durability, 
then it's either an active or a G6 right now are the two phones at the top of my list. And then below that, if you want to save some cash, I'm, I've always been a big fan of Kyocera. I like what they do with the Hydro line. I like what they do with um, the DuraForce line. I, I think, you know, they're not always the most exciting phones. They usually have pretty terrible cameras. Um, but some of the sonic screen tech is really cool for making your phone calls louder. And uh, my Brigadier is still the tankiest phone I've ever owned. It is the workbench phone of oh phone. yeah, it's the yeah. I accidentally dropped it on a table saw phone of phones. I mean that thing is a is yeah, a beast. I love that phone. right up there and in, in, in a two by four, you know, and it just it just it's fine. <laughs> it's it's better than fine. So. It did great. <laughs> right. So thank you, Aaron, for <laughs> that one. Uh, I'm not sure whether to uh, go which one to go to because uh, I you know. Well, look, look up the questions. I want to get to a couple of these tweets real quick. Yeah. We'll use these tweets as a as a uh, transition from Harlow Espina. Uh, my V20 survived some nasty falls. I hope the V30 will be as robust. Again, I think maybe the most survivable phone I've had for drops has been the V10. Um, again, those stainless steel rails were killer. From Hugh Richardson, I think, uh, I think, oh, sorry, I've got, uh, I think Aaron would be better off going G6 with a case and screen protector over a z2 force especially given the price differences and that's actually a pretty a pretty yeah. solid consideration too if you like uh, lg software you're going to have a much smoother transition from the g5 to the g6 you can get the g6 pretty cheap if you shop it um and, and also you picturing y'all with uh scotty vests at the water park <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that, i was just gonna mention cool. that too i i like i should show up in a in like a speedo and a scotty vest <laughs> for all of my phones <laughs> <laughs> so many just pockets full of bleached water. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, I love it. So I want to I want to track to an earlier question we got right before the podcast started. Um, I just have to uh, to scroll back, and uh, this is from Andrew Wallace uh, at Fat Produce, and and as we've mentioned on the podcast, the keeper of the Star Trek gifs, and he has a question about uh, Fitbit's new smartwatch design, and uh, he he le ends it off with, "We lost Pebble for this smartwatch." <laughs> dot 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 have you pulled up what this thing looks like yet jules uh, not actually um, Here, I'll, I'll screen share so that you can see uh you can see off of uh off of me if it will allow me to do a screen try, share. Try figure out yeah because like i'm between the emails and everything else because this uh there's one that you mentioned at the top of the show that i didn't originally clue include <laughs> because it was a little it was a little spicy kind of off topic and um you know that's pretty. Oh, man. So, so, yeah, I mean, this looks a lot like uh, their other fitness uh, smartwatch solution. What was the other one? It's not the, the Fitbit. HR is their heart rate tracker. It's the search, right? They have too many names. <laughs> too, too many yeah. names. Just too many notes. Yeah. Just get rid of some of the notes, uh, and uh, it will be easier to listen to. <laughs> yeah, char charge HR. I, I think it's the charge or something like that, but... um. But I mean, it was either the charge or the surge, and it was almost, uh, yeah. um, again, almost identical to this kind of layout, this sort of square-ish um, thing. I, I, I don't think that Fitbit optioned Pebble's technology and intellectual property to try and deliver a Pebble experience. I think they were just looking at a catalog of features. They probably wanted a handful of patents or one or two individual features. And it's the, in their they library. They can... Yeah. Yeah. It just kind of they it came yes. with having to buy the entire catalog of Pebble Tech. Unfortunately, I I think the dream of owning a Pebble like smartwatch is probably gone now. I was about to say it's in their library. They can show it off when they do interviews uh, in that dignified you know politician manner where they have the fully stocked bookcase behind them and you know never really touch anything behind them. So great. So <laughs> now if if this render is true though, we're looking at a proprietary watch strap design, these little clasps that connect the watch strap. That's gonna be kind of frustrating. I like having just regular pins um that are standard for different bracelets. And I'm not sure I love the way that this thing angles back into the uh the heart rate sensor. Um that depending on how this sort of presses up against the wrist, it could stick out sort of awkwardly and then the watch strap's gonna pull it into your wrist. Um, sometimes that fit can be uh, a little irritating depending on how that's that's all put together. I don't know. I mean, Fitbit wasn't really my go-to solution for any kind of smartwatch. Uh, 
So I'm not overly excited about any future smartwatch from them. And this isn't going to replace what I loved about Pebbles. So I don't know. I don't know that this is going to solve Fitbit's uh, marketing, market share, and dropping sales. All right. So um, we're moving on to this next mail, which uh, is going to be tough for me to. I, I don't think I'll express any view of it, <laughs> which is but it's about the, it's about the Google uh, gender manifesto that. Um, uh, uh, that's been yes. This week. Again, a very sensitive topic. Yeah, and uh, this person does not want to be, you know, identified anonymous because uh, they would be in the minority uh, opinion and kind of like the okay. less open-minded opinion here. So I'll just uh, read off uh, what they say here. I do feel that there is another perspective that needs to be addressed with the regards to the firing of the Google employee that was fired uh, due to his diversity manifesto. Uh, full disclosure, I am a conservative. The employee was at most a moderate. I do want to see women in the tech fields and uh, in the tech fields and leadership roles. However, I believe it should be dependent on the skill of the individual rather than on a person's race, gender, or sexual orientation. Men and women do think and act differently. However, this analysis is not inherently a bad thing. Differences in opinions and ideas are diverse and should be expressed. From my observations, however, many diversity initiatives want to shut down ideals, uh, ideas and speech considered hateful and divisive. However, the standards of hateful or divisive speech seem to undermine those who express conservative opinions. This firing comes in tandem with YouTube demonetizing content it deems quote-unquote controversial. This vendetta against arbitrarily defined controversial speech is dangerous and a threat to society. A free marketplace of ideas is true intellectual diversity, preventing us from going to an Orwellian dystopia Ideological shaming should not be practiced. I know that you might not agree with what I have to say, but I feel that it needs to be expressed. All right. So with all that going on, uh, I, Jules, I give really us the don't answer. Give us, give us what's, what's right. What's wrong. Do it. Um, Put yourself out there. Uh, just uh, basically be everyone's going to be pissed off with us. If we say anything, <laughs> yeah, be yourself. I, I I like I want to acknowledge it. Like I sent the email, I was like, you know, like this this is an email that we got. I'm not sure if you want to cover this, and you know, surprise surprise, yeah. we are covering this. So, um, again, I really don't want to touch this with a ten foot rod, mostly because I really well. First of all, I I decide I like when I when I read the you know headlines, I was like, I was I'm not going to touch this. I'm not going to look at this because uh, at some point. I, I want to get away from the reaction, get away from the 24 kind of hour uh, news cycle of that and, you know, take a deep look when I actually have leisure and time to, you know, well, consider things I, I think, fully. So. I think there's a lot to unpack. And I feel any conversation, we could dedicate an entire podcast to this topic and bring on guests mm -hmm. and have debates and still. We could talk about smartphones really... for women, like, for, for example. Well, well, but I mean, and, and still barely scratch the surface as to some of the larger themes at play here when it comes to diversity in any kind of business, uh, business environment. Um, and so anything that we comment on here, I think your, your sort of uh, uh, whatever your disclaimer um, <laughs> sh should stand for this is a developing story in the context of a much larger and divisive topic that we're experiencing on almost all fronts, politics, media, content, entertainment, technology, business. This is indicative of a perspective which is evolving throughout our society. And we are, we're woefully unequipped to do it complete justice in the context of a segment on a podcast. Yeah. Now talking about this situation specifically, Google is a business and I kind of feel like in a capitalist society, Google should be allowed to conduct business how they see fit. Corporate including their speech, relationships, not speech. Including their relationships with their individual employees. Because having worked in some, in some larger industries and having worked for some government agencies as a contractor, a department of energy, 
I know firsthand that anything that's deemed somewhat controversial or explodes into any kind of public discussion becomes a humongous headache for your human resources department. So let's say Google did not fire this guy, but that this sort of public discussion and these trading manifestos was creating a toxic environment. This would be incredible evidence for someone to bring about some kind of discrimination lawsuit against Google. Like if, uh, if a, a woman or a minority or a minority woman felt that this was becoming a hostile workplace, what would be piece of evidence? Number one, it would be this manifesto. So do I necessarily agree with the firing from the basis of a free speech standpoint? No, I don't. I believe you should be allowed to say whatever you want free of government persecution. But that this was a public discussion being held on Google resources and inflaming part of Google's employee base, I don't see where Google is necessarily wrong to try and nip this in the bud. I think it it makes him a martyr. I think it actually brings, it's the, uh, what is it? The Streisand effect, where when you yeah. try and quiet a situation like this, it actually draws more attention to it. Um, but I, I don't think that Google was out of bounds. And I think that they were probably doing the best that they could in managing a volatile situation and trying to keep their business focused on the best possible outcome from a volatile situation and hoping that it would go away. Um, it's obviously not going to go away because of that action, but I don't think there was really any other recourse at this point that they could have taken to try and uh, mitigate the fallout it, from from the situation. If we're going to look at this from a public square versus private square, so, you know, take a look at Uber and its culture, its its own manifestos regarding its private behaviors uh, within the company. It was just it, it's it was bound to break out and you know it's only you're only as good as your perception and we've seen that in uh uber's actions and uber's declining popularity where lyft has just eaten them up so having google seen that you right. know it would have made sense for them to like you know what this this doesn't look good and it wouldn't look good in public so i mean there's that there's also the whole bunch of things that we can go into uh, about corporate first amendments you know hobby lobby right. uh recently with the whole uh, uh contraceptive uh law, scotus lawsuit so I beyond mean, that, that, that so, so i mean Jules, that's what's so difficult about one of these topics though is that it starts it starts opening the floodgates on Every other situation, I mean, again, if we're dealing just with this situation at this point, it's hard not to bring in the baggage from any other time that an individual has has encountered a perceived slight because of having or entertaining political discourse or a political speech in the context of a business environment. And, and that is what I mean, that's why we I think we get so hot blooded about these kinds of topics is because it's really difficult to separate from previous situations that have also felt complicated, dirty, not right, something like that. I don't think it's a corporation's place to try and enforce or engage or promote some kind of free speech ideal if there's a perceived danger of that speech impacting sales and shareholder value. A corporation does not exist to promote the First Amendment. A corporation exists to deliver shareholder value. So again, I don't really feel that there's any significant problem with Google's, uh, Google's firing this guy from a business perspective. But again, this is why we've got to unpack all of this and say like, did it, did it have the achieved outcome? Absolutely not. It turned this guy into a martyr and to a major talking point on sites like Reddit. And we're having a conversation about it right now too. And it detracts from, yeah, it detracts from our main goal, which is to talk about, well, mostly about hardware and the associated software services. Like there are totally valid concerns about the consumer end of this because I, you know, I always wonder how many women were in the room when people decided, you know, uh, to make a smartwatch for a woman, and it's all you know, crust, encrusted with gems, while not <laughs> addressing you know, the you know main what concern. The smartphone is it for it to be lavender colored and to have a jewel that hangs out of the headphone that's jack that lights up when you get an email. Like that's that's always <laughs> like if you're if you're trying to you know, I feel like you know, people are putting. You know, 
like beside the whole gender diversity or diversity of thought it's it, having executed using that in the right way in the first place so that we can right. not have flops or, or or you know such as the what was it the htc something whatever like that that the, the phone you're referring to but you know it's it's to prevent... I, I, in my brain i call it the htc ovaries because that's what <laughs> <laughs> like a man would think a woman would want in a phone and they're not only wrong but like they're completely wrong um okay all right. so let's get out of the sweet spot and go into well, another well, hold story. on i still want to talk about just just you know the okay. part of the discussion here whether or not you're for affirmative action or against affirmative action some of these other really dicey topics to discuss i mean i think it's been pretty clear over the course of producing this podcast that I lean more towards the bleeding heart than I do towards the conservative end of the political spectrum. But this is also the part of the conversation that we need to have. Is a company really delivering the products and services that you care about? Are they reaching out to the audiences that are going to benefit from this type of focus or this type of initiative? And are they losing sight of their customer base? If you feel that this is an area where Google is messing up, we live in a capitalist society. And I don't want to get all libertarian on this issue, but the market speaks and you have the ability to influence market decisions based on your purchasing or your um, or your your own individual monetary power and the ability to have these discussions in public forums free of government persecution. And that's what we need to continue to engage in. I am concerned about the current sort of liberal initiative in shaming individuals that have uh, opinions different from sort of a current generation liberal mindset. I, I tend to look at most issues as being more economic driven than racially driven. Um, I'm a pale skin Hispanic kid, so I benefit from some uh, aspects of privilege, but I haven't benefited from all. And I am a quarter Native American, you know, so my perspective to these things is singular. And I think that's also one of the other things that we absolutely have to keep sight of and where I've been most disappointed in the liberal conversation is conflating individual experiences with demographic experiences and, and how we approach problems. We need to have a good balance of both. And I don't think anyone would necessarily disagree with looking at the numbers of larger overall institutional gathered data versus the numbers and the personal experiences of individuals who have gone through different um, problems and different challenges in their lives. And I think that's where we can come together to have meaningful conversations, but it's not going to happen if we continue to listen to the tiniest vocalist minority of angry people in this space. Then we don't reach any conclusions. Then we don't solve any problems. Then we all just get defensive, put our shields up, and we don't listen to the other person opposite us. You know, in this I don't field think, of communication, let me, let me just wrap this one up. One thing this, that has been happening, yeah. The last thing that I wanted to say, it's not a business's responsibility to foster that conversation. I don't want corporations being the, the stewards of free speech. That's so if marketing. a business has, has to make, yeah, that's, a mar that's the marketing department. Um, that's a PR company. Um, if, if, if a business still has to protect their assets and their interests, then that's up to the business. I, I don't see anything wrong with that, actually, from the libertarian perspective. The business should be able to operate how they want to operate. And if an individual employee is causing this much grief, then that's, that's the situation. But outside of that corporate responsibility, when we're looking at individuals and we're looking at discussion in the greater political realm, that's where I feel we need to have more substantive conversations and, and a little less of the whinging on both sides from the people who are most emotionally active, but not really looking at how we can solve problems, really looking more to create thought crime or to, to express negativity outside of that. And, and this is something that I feel is, is, is probably well represented on both sides of this debate, is people with their own personal agendas and trying to stir up some kind of victimhood um, we're not going to solve problems that way. We're only going to make the divides larger. For a field of, you know, this where internet, the internet has opened up communications. People have been trying to uh, more like they they've created different silos. It's always been just a silo, uh, a, a field of silos, and yeah, I I think this is the you know bringing that conversation into the open and being able to 
not only express yourself in a mature um, and well thought out opinion of manner. Um, I don't, th- I think between like the outrage machines that we've built up, it's especially, it's, it's, it's harder it's and harder porn. to, it's, it totally is. It's like, what am I supposed to be angry about today? Let me go to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> iOS Android. Oh my God. Hey. Let's get into a more Woo. controversial and divisive topic. Ready? Go. Yeah. All right. So from Peter Hayton, uh, basically it boils down to these two questions and there's a whole, but, um, uh, accessibility, uh, topic we can get into afterwards, but, um, how are the current impacts of voice assistant fragmentations, uh, affecting us right now, especially with the HTC U11 having access to three. So we have the Sans companion, we have Google assistant, and then we have the new Alexa integration, just like it's, it's, a. Uh, we're having fun, I guess. And then <laughs> there's also the essential home, which is supposed to play nicely with all of them. So it's like, right. yeah, this is this is useful to us. This is this is supposed to be useful to us, but uh, it's it's too many at once. Well, no, I, you know, again, it's it's one of those things. Isn't like, it? what do we really expect people to dig into when they're going to try and take advantage of like a software assistant? And I just feel that there is a terrible lack of conveyance in what these things can can do and unfortunately consumers are only apt to give them a try once or twice and then the novelty wears off and i don't think they're really going to you know dive down that rabbit hole to see what else they can do or when the software gets updated so i think one of the reasons why we've seen so many changes like google google now google assistant google ai all these different sort of permutations of voice search on android why google keeps renaming it is that people will come back and try the new app, even though it's really kind of the same evolution of what they had before. They just weren't w- willing to like keep checking in to see what those new features or those new services. It has a new logo in. and everything, and exactly. too, and yeah, I guess, the, yeah, the whole fragment, you know, fragmentation. I, I really like how Peter points this out. Um, for example, uh, with Philips uh, Hue lighting. Alexa will set a scene but not a color, and Google will set a color but not, <laughs> but not a scene. A scene. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's perfect. perfect. Like, yeah. It's complimentary, but it's not like like you have to call it up in the first place. So if right. you have both of them, you all right, Google, set a night scene or set a set, set an orange color, and then Alexa said that's not that's not efficient, that's not right. <laughs> I mean, obviously the only correct answer is Cortana. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> again, sorry, I'm I'm trying not to hack up my lungs on this mic. Um, no, this is this is why this field is still so wide open. These are the first baby steps in trying to interact with data and services in another in another way. Not just I stare at glowing rectangle, I touch glowing rectangle. It's can we really incorporate meaningful and emotionally contextually relevant? Uh, Inter- interactions, experiences, um, and use something like audio? Can we use something like augmented reality? What what else can we do to push the boundaries on how we keep people plugged in? At the same time, potentially solving some of the etiquette and uh, dangerous problems with utilizing mobile technology. I, I, if you caught the uh, the Periscope last week, we got down this really deep conversation just about you know social etiquette and then also uh, um, te- mobile technology where you know your sm- smartphones are probably more responsible for fatalities in this country than terrorist attacks. You know if we look at the driving statistics on distracted driving, and we're not in as much of an uproar as we are about national security, but we could be taking bigger, grander steps to try and solve this problem or at least mitigate some of this issue before we get to self-driving cars. Um, this is another one of those baby steps, smartwatches, some kind of heads up display, better audio integration, better wireless audio solutions. These are all the little baby steps that we can take to try and help correct some of these problems. But ultimately, I don't think we get there until we can get a more comprehensive software package that can take more of the heavy lifting off our, off our plates. You know, I'm going to mention, I want an IBM Watson phone and better automation around us for certain sort of uh, 
easily distracted scenarios, things like better cruise control, better radar assist, better self-piloting capabilities, and ultimately full-on autonomous driving vehicles. At that point, then I think we've got a lot more room to experiment with how do we use our phones? Because right now in Southern California, especially, every time you pull up to a stoplight, it's scary. Every single time I'm behind the wheel of a car, there is almost always some potential altercation. Most of the time it would have been something like, you know, almost getting rear-ended or someone sort of drifting into my lane or something else. But it was, you know, it was last week trying to make a left-hand turn and realizing that even though I'm on a solid red because I had to wait in the intersection for people to, to finish coasting through, that long after the red, someone wasn't going to stop and they were looking down in their lap. And you're like, I'm about to get into a head-on accident, head-on collision with a car going 45 miles an hour with my daughter in the back seat. And I had to pull like an emergency uh, turn back into the middle of an intersection just to avoid it. And I don't know that he ever looked up. <laughs> so I mean, like this stuff happens every single time I'm behind the wheel of a car. And a lot of it is influenced by how we use mobile technology. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I don't mean to shorten that conversation uh, any, any little, but it's just that this next one and last one is uh, is a mouthful. And I'm going to try. Oh, hold on! Before you do that, I just wanted this one this one tweet from uh, Harlow Espina using the PN Weekly yeah. hashtag. Google Assistant has been ignoring me since I've been trying to use Bixby. I think she's mad at me. <laughs> I think the best way that you can oh. actually you know prevent that is uh, by supporting the Kickstarter with the case for the Galaxy S8 that actually uh, can <laughs> yeah. the button. <laughs> well, we all know that Google cool. holds a grudge, though. I mean, look at how long we had to go off air just for streaming because we talked so much crap about Hangouts all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. Send, it's great. Send Google Assistant some flowers, maybe some chocolates. I don't know what she's into, but you can win her back. I, I'm rooting for you, Harlow. I think you can do it. Go, go do it. Go send those flowers to the Googleplex, I guess. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so, uh, last one, and uh, for all of you who have tuned in for like T-Mobile Revel and all that stuff, I think we can definitely, there's a whole bunch that we can get to here, but um, how do we tackle this? All right, so, Brian Davis is a Sprint uh, employee. He has been for many years, and uh, he just wrote a huge, huge email it's not a huge little email about I, um, it's it's a pretty decent manifesto actually i mean if, if t-mobile <laughs> is the beats of wireless and Ooh. when you think about beats you know you, you it comes to all the marketing and all the the hype around it and you know for sound that objectively is not you, you know is it like if you it's not good i guess or it's not it's not proper but our basis it's you know, it's doing very, very well for itself. Yes, so yes it is. I so like th this is way too long to actually go through, but I have a few questions that we can turn on one by one that I've boiled them down to. So, John Ledger, or John Ledger, <laughs> turned from man in suit to rebel, proclaiming uh, back when he was first uh, inaugurated as CEO in 2012 that T-Mobile was fairer and cheaper than Dumb and Dumber with no contracts and all that stuff so why so much hype and why the anger why the why the the fist in the air uh to all these uh carriers was it just a good idea to um break that bs or or what well uh, but i think you know a, a major part of t-mobile's relationship during the john john ledger ledger john, i keep saying ledger i know that's wrong no, that's me too <clears throat> you know like with, with his reign as ceo We've found a company that has found a way to, again, emotionally resonate with consumers to try and develop a relationship beyond just, you know, I give them money and I get cell service. Again, they made T-Mobile, he made, helped make T-Mobile into a lifestyle commentary. You know, so I I I don't do business with Verizon or AT and T because I'm younger and hipper, and I care about you know fair business practices and all these things. And and whether or not any of this stuff is completely true, it's it's just those talking points that branding, that marketing, the uncarrier has done very well for this company. And I don't think you can do that without delivering some incendiary or controversial headlines, right? If if you yeah. don't have 
people talking about your brand, you don't exist. And so I think that's been the big strategic victory here is they stood as a thumb in the eye to the AT&Ts and Verizons of the wireless market. And it's worked that they've become a very solid third place competitor. When uh, John started as CEO, I think they were a distant fourth place competitor mm -hmm. behind Sprint. And no company has really managed to find that messaging that really resonates. Verizon used to have it with network reliability and stability, but that's become less of a concern for consumer uh, potential co uh, customers out there. Yeah, I think contracts uh, were the dirty word uh, yeah. back five years ago, and uh, people really wanted to, especially when they, they started breaking their neat little phones, their iPhones that they've started to appreciate, and right. you know they, they just wanted to get out of their contract. And especially when they had all those, uh, like up to $650 a line, if you uh, move to us right now, do it. And they got like 10 million subscribers or something like that yeah. in just the first year that they... Um, uh, ex executed on that. Uh, when T-Mobile went to no contract in 13, 2013, did it have to go with these uh, equipment installment plans? Like, was it really the best route to do that? Because nowadays we're switching over to uh, leasing yeah. and um, you know, where people had more flexibility, even though there's a little bit of a, a payment uh, uh, jockeying at the end of things. But, you know, it allows them to uh, move up um, but I don't think we had to start somewhere because um, zero percent no, financing on all these uh, all these uh, phones, you know, this six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred dollar purchases are just it's you know you had to start somewhere in order to build credit. Like this wasn't just you know um, subsidize and pay uh, pay for whole. This is um, actually making sure that there was revenue that that was coming in and it had to be guaranteed to the creditors and. Right. Yeah. So that's well, no, I because I, I completely agree. You know, this look at how long it's taken to deprogram the American customer out of the normal two year contract cycle we used to go through. So, you know, what an equipment installment plan was easy to explain and easy to to add to a bill in a way that customers could understand what was happening and how they were getting their phone and what it was going to cost them. And it set the stage for now these new leasing options, these new leasing plans and the update to the jump. Uh, you know, you can switch your phone on T-Mobile every 30 days now. It's all smart packaging. So do we really expect consumers out there to be flipping their phone every 30 days? No. In fact, I doubt many consumers will flip their phone more often than they used to be allowed to where you could only switch your phone over three times a year, I'd be shocked if a majority of their customers flip their phone more often than that. But doesn't it feel good to know that you could? It's kind of like buying like an expanded insurance package, you know, like, you know, we also have like valet service and, you know, triple A and, you know, fix a flat and fuel yeah. recovery if you're stranded on the highway. And like, how many people oh, really use those? But yeah. it feels good to pay for them knowing that they're there. And that's kind of where I see T-Mobile currently right now is a lot of the stuff people aren't going to use, like international rates and all that, all, all, all that jazz. Probably not. But people want to know that they have it even if they never use it. Although fair is fair. It's all, you know, you have to, you know, if you want to trade in, it's, it has to be in good condition. I think um, insurance mm -hmm. used to be included but not the case anymore in terms of uh, you have to make sure that you know if you want to um protect your device you have to purchase an extra nine to twelve dollars a month so that's yeah. that is, in itself is kind of and then there's also the deductible so i think it's still that's still kind of a thing that we need to solve and someone's going to solve it maybe it's going to be sprint i mean they they're i don't know um, in terms of T-Mobile One, when we had that little change with Verizon Unlimited, mm -hmm. uh, when you compare them apples to, apples to apples, the features are the same for the same price. And T-Mobile's, I'm not sure how T-Mobile's trying to um, image themselves because, oh, it's is, is it better value because they're the same price? Or in like the standard T-Mobile One for 70 or $75 a month and you get throttled um, video streaming and all that? Uh, no hotspot. So, I mean, is it, is it, I mean, it's providing the options and it's right, getting, but, but I would also work. ask what, what did we have as a plan prior to Verizon 
returning to an unlimited plan? Uh, it was all bucketed. Uh, most that we had, I think, was like. So this this to me really stands as one of those opportunities that businesses can still compete in this sector because for a while there it really felt like every carrier had exactly the same plan with a couple different little tweaks to it or different fee structures or you'd end up eventually arriving at pretty much the same thing across the board and before Verizon returned to unlimited T-Mobile was pretty aggressive about promoting this kind of service. So this is an opportunity for another company to come in and compete with a better product or a different product or a more expensive or a more or a less expensive product. And so when viewed in its current state right now, uh, for a lot of people, that Verizon plan might be a better deal. But when viewed in the larger context of how these plans evolved and how we got to this point, we wouldn't be dealing with a Verizon unlimited plan or an AT&T unlimited plan that wasn't tied directly to direct TV subscribership if it hadn't been for Sprint and Anti Mobile offering different rate packages, different buy-ins, different perks, you know, ending, you know, paying for contracts, stuff like that. Um, if the smaller players hadn't been putting pressure on the bigger players, then we'd all still be in like two gigabytes of data is only 150 bucks a month. You know, like we'd be in the same in the same boat. There would be no incentive for AT&T and Verizon to directly compete against each other without some kind of disruptor coming in. Yeah, indeed. And uh, all right, so this one I'm going to have to tread carefully on as well. <laughs> uh, T-Mobile is said to spread its towers thin, where other carriers go for density and better bre uh, bandwidth and speed and in city centers. Um, he's accusing them of cheaply pumping up uh, POPs, uh, people served under LTE. So instead of like four towers in a city, it's just one tower. Uh, and then they spread that around. Um, so, I mean, if, yeah. you know, he would have more say than us in terms of knowing about that. But um, I don't so, know. so I cannot speak from any kind of actual market knowledge. Like I don't know what T-Mobile's tower distribution looks like directly compared to the competition. But we do know what we how. do know is well, I that mean, again. That, that's what I'm saying is is getting to what we do know. We are still talking about um, the third place, formerly fourth place carrier in the United States who didn't benefit as much from other acquisitions as AT&T and Verizon did. I mean, a re one of the reasons why these companies have the kind of penetration that they did was the sort of mad dash to buy up smaller competitors. Remember how many other players used to be in this market. Um, and, and, you know, one of the reasons why I think Sprint got hammered so hard after buying Nextel was how different those technologies were and how long it took them to reconcile those towers. Um, so when we look at T-Mobile, I look at a company that benefited significantly from the failed buyout from AT&T, uh, subsidizing huge chunks of their business on AT&T's dime. And one of the things that I think they've been a bit more future focused on have been things like uh, Spectrum, buying a better building penetrating Spectrum. And I know at Fat Produce, Andrew Wallace is probably flipping that I'm going to mention 600 megahertz. Um, but <laughs> you can have fewer towers if you're putting your money on the ability to spread that signal further per tower. Does that fully make up the difference between having a better network of towers? I don't think so. But again, we're talking about a service that's trying to bill itself as being more cost effective. And I think that's an opportunity for consumers to know that there could be some compromises in some areas of the country because of that. Whether or not a consumer is going to do that kind of homework I find dubious, but I think that's the reality of the market. You know, you do pay more for certain aspects of wireless and carrier coverage than you will for others. And I don't think that T-Mobile is necessarily being anti-consumer duplicitous in how their services are advertised once we get over that initial like, you know, like Sprint saying, oh, all carriers are within 1%. And you're like, yeah, sort of. Not really, but that's all branding. That's all marketing, you know? So again, if a consumer cares about that kind of clarity, they're going to look it up. If a consumer doesn't care about that clarity and is disappointed in the service, they'll switch to another carrier. I mean, that's kind of how this market's going to have to exist in the short term.
Yeah, and especially with you know, it's kind of it's always been kind of hard to actually do ground tests of every single thing. It's just like yeah. uh, word of mouth. Oh, this I have T-Mobile and it's working well, but yeah, you we, know. We, we don't have even the infrastructures to test in the cities that we live in. Um, but I can say that like T-Mobile, especially around yeah. the Valley, um, is more than competitive with AT&T and Verizon's offerings. And I, I think the only carrier that's still struggling out here, again, we're still talking about their retrofit for their towers is Sprint, where it, it could be one block to the next where I've got screaming fast LTE and then like nothing. <laughs> yeah. as i'm driving around you're know, like wow this this cuts in and out really frequently um t-mobile has been pretty consistent for where i live and is usually decent enough in denser population center like downtown la like it's fine it's not really any better or worse than at&t yeah yeah and uh well i guess it, you know when it comes to like doing all that homework i mean aren't we there to help them out <laughs> aren't we there to yeah. <laughs> I mean, as best we can, but again, it's, it's, I, I would very, you know, I would take my anecdotal experiences with all four major carrier networks with a humongous boulder of salt because it's impossible to have a good sort of shotgun spread of locations around the megapolis, which is the greater Los Angeles area. Um, and just how different population density shifts around freeways can have a huge impact from day to day as to how you're testing um, wireless carrier signal and reliability, signal strength, et cetera. So, you know, it, it's one of those things like, I think I would have to dedicate a couple months to devising standardized tests to come up with general trends that you still wouldn't necessarily rely on to make a customer's purchasing recommendation but it would just give you a better a, a better overview of what carrier signal was like over the course of that month and even then it would be an incomplete discussion you know like if we were uh, consumer reports we could dedicate more manpower for every city to try and accomplish that in a more efficient fashion but you know i would have to give up on every single phone review article editorial podcast for a solid month to come up with a really thin surface examination of the, of the market as it stands today. Or you could just, you know, not recommend surface products and uh, never do that <laughs> because you're certain because you found out that reliability is actually a little bit worse than uh, the average <laughs> uh, laptop. So that's what they did. Totally surface. Damn it. Yeah. That was a good pun. Jules. Darn it. That was a good pun. <laughs> No, it's true. I mean, did you you, you saw the you saw their their thing today about retracting their recommendations, right? For uh, retracting what recommendations? Uh, for the Surface Pro, uh, no, not the Surface Pro, but they they said oh, they're not going to the consumer reports. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, but up, um, that's that. We, we're kind of ending on a downer, and we're kind of just wow. We're, we're, we're trying. So let's let's just uh, edge off of this here uh, uh, from Andrew Wallace at Fat Produce. Give me all the 600 megahertz <laughs> weekly. And he's got a great Captain oh, Kirk Shatner. screaming GIF. Uh, that that's always exciting um, from uh, from Peter Hayton. Hayton uh, I guess the success of T-Mobile is to ask how many people talk about their carrier out of interest. Again, I mean, if you make your company a part of someone's lifestyle, they are will be more loyal it works for apple it works for clothing it works for bags and purses um One I should... think, well, but, but i think t-mobile has done the best job of being sort of an active participant in their customers lives um than the other carriers have uh from uh from renato not long ago we were talking about telecom wanting to get rid of t-mobile us now they want to implement its management back home in germany um, I think that's a smart play. Again, this this market is fiercely competitive, so any kind of uh, emotional or consumer edge is going to work to your fashion. Um, and then we did get a number of comments from people about the uh, the Google manifesto, and I'm going to try and take some of those off off podcast or offline. Um, just a, a lot of people have very strong feelings about things like you know free speech and corporate pressure on different types of speech, and I, I really want to sort of respect those viewpoints. Um, some of them conflicting with my own, but again, it's it's difficult. And and I want to you know anyone who's trying to have that conversation with me to understand 
and have a little patience that if this starts broadening out or tangents start propping up or people start changing topics or changing directions or uh, talking about other situations or other problems, then I, like I have to bow out of that conversation because I don't think it serves anyone when we get stuck in a sort of ever descending uh, circular conversation of, oh yeah, well, someone else did something terrible. Oh yeah, we'll remember when this happened and that was bad. Um, I, I think it's more important to stay focused on the actual circumstances of this one situation and to try and hash out how we feel about that rather than trying to apply it as something indicative of every single time we talk about diversity or gender or racial issues as it pertains to business and technology. So again, I, I really want people to understand, like I'm trying to respect how sensitive this topic is. And it's not that I'm going to be ignoring people, but they're just, I have limited bandwidth to get into yeah. too much of an online debate in 140 characters or less per her talking yeah about. indeed it's 2 30 a.m this nightline abc news town hall uh regarding gender diversity and race is running way too long i think we have to, nah. we have <laughs> we to, should, we to put a pin in it yeah definitely you remember those yeah you remember those uh town halls they like they started at 11 30 and then they ran until like 2 30 it was like crazy I, you know, again, I, I wish we had better uh, better avenues for long form discussion in in sort of uh, appropriate places because a lot of the stuff I think is being dragged into arenas that aren't really the best fit for this kind of conversation. You know, like Twitter is the worst place to try and talk about this type of topic. You know, trying to follow the thread of a conversation or trying to have someone expand on a point of view or an opinion is is ruthlessly terrible when you have that kind of uh, character restriction on trying to accomplish your your idea or your talking point. All right, make sure that you have your te telepathy buckets on and uh, we'll see you again real soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, until we have like an empathy sensor in our uh, in our social media, it's just gonna it's just gonna be really dicey. But there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, <laughs> which I just got done <laughs> saying is not the best place to have really in depth conversations. Where Jules is at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube. And our home site, pocketnow.com, also now in Spanish, es.pocketnow.com. We're basically everywhere. Shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews anywhere a podcast can be reviewed. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. They're helping us keep the lights on here with tasty home-cooked meals. Definitely use that promo code POCKETNOW30 to save some cash. But ultimately, there would not be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune in.